Welcome back to my studio practice. Uh, as you can see, the painting of the Akakari is now more or less complete. Uh, I'm calling it finished. Uh, you can see that there's been a lot of work on this and not all of it sadly has been documented uh, due to uh, my ill health. Um, so, um, we're going to backpedal a little bit and see the stages which um, brought this piece to uh, the conclusion that it is um, that you see in front of you now, uh, where I increased the intensity of the chroma and the yellows and reds, uh, the detailing on the beak. Uh, in fact, um, even the blues, the blue greys on the black of the bird's body have actually helped it pop forward and actually push that um, soft focus background further back. So it just seems that the more detail, it seems kind of intuitive, that the more detail that you put in the foreground, the more that you have to look at there, the more the um, blurred uh, image, the background, becomes soft focus and recedes into the background. Okay, so I had a lot of fun doing this and uh, today I think is the 11th of June. So I've got two of these paintings, two paintings in June. First of all, um, this little hummingbird and now this uh, Akakari. I think it's an Akakari. Um, both using Windsor and Newton water soluble oils with various media from their range um, and uh, applied using brushes uh, from Rosemary & Co. I'm not sponsored by either of these, I just uh, am exploring um, this water soluble oil and learning to enjoy it, learning to, to see how it works on this uh, small scale for me, quite small scale. Um, so um, I think that's enough. What's going to happen is I'm going to transition over to a playback of a video and um, there may be a little uh, stall uh, while I set it up and reset it uh, back to the beginning. But this will show you and I'll narrate all the thought processes that were going through my mind as it was being created. Okay, I hope you enjoy it. So, as you can see, I'm in with the cadmium yellow light on a Rosemary and Co. Uh, rigger. I've got three of these brushes. I just love them. I like the little thin lines that you can make with them and the, the small details. Those individual hairs uh, that go to make up the hairs that constitute the feathers of the bird. Now, this cadmium yellow light isn't neat. It's been mixed with titanium white uh, to bring a highlight onto the upper part of that chest. But as I proceed further down the body, less material is being applied onto the surface and so that gives a transition to the darker value. The green was my shade colour for that. Again, I am trying to follow the shape of the body on the bird because this is a good strategy to actually modeling um, the form of um, a bird or an animal is to actually create the strokes in the direction that they would um, change from various different planes according to the um, structure of the skeleton and muscles underneath. So here I'm just visiting all the areas that are in yellow that they were just um, a little bit on the dark side and so we need to bring them forward, bring them up to their true value. 
getting closer and closer to the value of the photo in the top right hand corner that you see. I'm not concerned about making an exact copy. I want to be inspired by the um, photograph, but I don't want to be bogged down with making an exact copy. Okay, the brush lacked all the tiny little feather uh, details that I was looking for. So this is a Derwent uh, embossing tool which you can get from the Derwent um, a set of two pencils and two embossing tools. You get them as a sort of pack. And I like to use them uh, to create scraffito on my birds uh, because it gives a lovely um, feathered effect. So the yellow has been applied. And I'm just trying to bring out areas of detail um, which occur to me. There's a little bit on the reverse side which is a little bit too green. So the green was my shadow uh, value for this yellow. Uh, but that needs to be brought up a little bit. The chroma needs to be heightened on that to show that the body rotates round and can support that head. So it's to model the form and make it kind of um, uh, um, cylindrical. Um, so back on the palette, you can see me mixing, going in with extra titanium white into the mix. And uh, a small amount of titanium can make a big difference. Uh, I regularly recommend that um, you use zinc white for mixing because titanium white is so strong. But actually, now that I've gotten to use it quite a lot, I'm beginning to um, really like um, the alterations it can make in a short. You know, just a small amount of titanium white is going to make a big difference in your mix. And as long as you can learn how to control um, what well, is a powerful tool, it's a very, very strong uh, colour. Uh, you can learn how to use it, then there's nothing wrong with titanium white. But then zinc white, like Kremnitz white or any of the other whites, like uh, permanent white, white uh, are going to have slightly but perceptible differences in their outcomes. So back with the embossing tool. I sometimes do this, I dip the embossing tool, bottom right hand corner, I'm in at the Elizabeth Crimson and uh, I'm using the embossing tool. Ah, okay, that's to get through the skin and uh, get at the fresh paint because this has been lying about for a few days. My apologies. But I have been known to actually paint by dabbing in the um, embossing um, the embossing tool into paint. Like for instance, if you're going to do the highlight of an eye, you can just dip into white, do a little tap, and that's uh, that's it. So back into the alizarin crimson, back into the uh, cadmium red light. So it's a combination mix. Uh, it's been um, influenced by yellow somewhat, so it's going to nudge towards orange. And here's a trick that I do. I put some paint onto the ferrule of another brush. So I wipe off the excess, and so I make a little bead that I can take a little piece of colour. And, uh, and then I can apply it more uh, particularly. So here I'm doing the kind of red banding on the underside uh, of the uh, belly and flank towards where the right wing is on this bird. So I felt that the area needed, um, that red needed to be a little bit more expansive there because that yellow is quite a large area. 
and the red breaks it up quite nicely. But I also noticed with these paint that paints that they're so heavily pigmented that you get a lot of coverage with even a small amount. In my mix, I've got uh, a lot more um, uh, stand oil, Windsor & Newton water mixable stand oil, which goes with the series of paints. Uh, and so, yeah, it's to observe the fat over lean principle that we try to observe when using um, oil colour and it still applies to these water mixable oil colours as well. The fat over lean rule still applies. So a little bit of red there to the rump where I've, uh, I've now gone back to the underbelly and using the embossing tool to scrape out, create some texture, also create some detailing uh, of uh, feathers. So are made up of um, hairs, but those hairs are interlocked with barbs and barbules. Uh, a little bit of red added to the beak to lift that out a little bit more to warm up a little bit because the beak was proving to be a dull area. So I'm just generally tidying up. At this stage, it's just little changes are making, hopefully, uh, a bigger impact. Okay, there's a more orangey mix. It's with the alizarin crimson, uh, part alizarin, part cadmium red uh, light, and a bit of the uh, cad yellow to make um, more orange for the highlights on the red. The red, uh, the warmest part of the red reminds me of vermilion. So um, I think what we're trying to do is create a kind of orangey red to make it sing out a little bit more. To me, that seems a little bit heavy handed at the moment. So I hope I scrape that back a little bit. <laughs> but a lot more is needed on the rump. And so it does. And applied in such a way that it darkens towards the underside of that wingtip because the red that is there already that's being overpainted would make a lovely um, cast shadow uh, colour for for the under the wing uh, where the light can't reach. So it suggests that there's a bit of shade cast uh, by the overhanging wing tip, wingtip. Thank goodness, because <laughs> I felt that was quite strong. But what I'm doing is scraping through that layer and it will reveal other layers before. It also remove material, which sometimes gets wiped off. So um, you can use it to uh, transition colors, get a kind of shading effect, just by breaking up the um, tonal mass. So, and again on the rump as well, we want to create a little bit of uh, feathering there. Yeah, the flight feathers are interlocking, so they're all made up of these little hairs, but the, um, they are to greater or lesser de degrees uh, more web-like, depending on these little hooks that they've got to hook it all together to create a membrane. But on the chest and underside, these are not flying feathers, and so they're very loose. They're kind of disconnected, very fluffy. Uh, they don't have any kind of um, uh, rigidity to them. And so it's very important to to try at least to get the illusion of this kind of um, raggedy, hairy kind of um, effect. However, working this small, uh, there's only so much that you can do. Although there are artists out there that take great delight in painting tiny, tiny little details and uh, that's to be admired. For me, I'm working quite small so that I can improve the rehabilitation of my right hand. Um, 
which is recovering now two years into recovering from a, an assault that damaged my right thumb. So now what I'm doing is I'm creasing the reference photo on the side uh, to have a look at all those lovely bromeliads and epiphytes, plants that live on top of other plants. Uh, some are parasitic, some of them are... Um, uh, they just uh, get a better vantage point, a better growing point by climbing on. In the same way that an ivy will climb up a, a taller tree to get to the light. So, But I'm absolutely uh, intrigued by these leaves that hang upside down on branches. They're just so characteristic. Um, and um, for me, they recall... Um, you know, the visit that we've had to Costa Rica. So just trying to get the balance right between the tones and now that the paint has been applied, just nudging the colours in the directions that they need to go. There is a black band under the belly that I've just sort of chosen to ignore. Um, I suppose I could put it in a little bit. I may even be here lifting out from a, from an area like the rump excess paint to paint the eye and put a warm kind of reddish glow onto the the Akakari's beak. So that's what's happening now with the eye. Sadly, my photo has covered up the palette for you, but there's a lot in this series and the colours are uh, reiterated uh, quite often. The blue that goes onto the black of the bird is uh, mixed with indigo and titanium white and sometimes nudged in one direction or other using uh, French ultramarine blue or uh, burnt umber. So we'll be seeing that very, very soon. Okay, you can just see in the bottom corner of some mixing, um, uh, rotating the brush in the mix. The stand oil is um, the last of the mediums that I've been uh, practicing with, and it's taking me a little while to get used to it, but it is very gloopy, it's very viscous, and it made the painting of the um, leaves on the underside of that branch an absolute joy. Uh, to just apply, uh, make thicker applications of paint and just apply it. But in the meantime, mixing up the colours with that rigger. And getting ready to paint those leaves. Just a very gentle press and then pull away from the surface. Now, I can't copy every single um, leaf that's there, so obviously I'm just getting a feel for uh, how the plants interact with each other, what their symbiotic relationship is, um, how they're fastened. Um, I think some more research is needed in this area and perhaps even practical research with them um, going back to Costa Rica and actually visiting these things. But what I've learned um, in the process of doing this study is that in the last probably three or four paintings that I've done is um, I've developed a love of these overgrown um, branches. It's just so full of character. Um, that they could all almost make a subject in themselves uh, without the need for a star signature bird such as the you know the Akakari.
Now that tall leaf at the top needs to come out a little bit more. And the area underneath that uh, bromeliad to the left of the apicari is a little bit confused. However, I don't want to overdo the details on the branch because um, as well as the background, the branch is not the star of the show. I want the attention to go to the bird itself. And so uh, I'm making an editorial decision just on how much detail goes on the branch. You could almost spend a lifetime just uh, building up layers of paint to make a very heavily impasto textured uh, branch. Um, now there's an artist who painted um, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of paint until they became so heavily encrusted with paint. So his name was Frank Auerbach. And so if I'd wanted to, I could take, learn lessons from Frank Auerbach's work. A-U-E-R-B-A-C-H, Auerbach. And uh, yeah, use heavy, heavy impasto techniques just to make um, the branch even more 3D. But even without that, in the Winsor & Newton range, there are oleopasto past, oleo and, uh, excuse me, I'm struggling, and um, impasto medium that would help you uh, create even more body in your brush works. But at this moment, I'm really enjo enjoying the painting just it just has an immediacy when you get the mix of the you know the paint right and the medium right uh, and it just flows exactly the way you want to at the speed of thought you can just uh, uh, create the mark making that you need it's simply a joy to work with and so if nothing else i hope you're inspired to you know trust the medium and give it a go uh, there are some mosses on the branch, uh, and now that the majority of the paint is off my brush, I'm trying a kind of dry brush technique, uh, holding the brush at a very low angle, a very uh, oblique or acute angle to the surface of the canvas to try and use the hairs of the brush side on, and just to get a gentle kind of grazing of the colour uh, on the texture that is actually there. So there's a reddishness there that I wanted to bring out. I've done a little bit more since. So this brings us up to the stage before the, the final stage. Uh, the finishing stages of building a guitar, uh, for those of you that are interested, is called finiting, the finishing touches. So uh, this video doesn't go up to the finiting stage, um, but very, very close. So there's titanium white mixed into the green mix. And uh, because the paint is so viscous, it's very easy to blend uh, the paints and endlessly correct. But at that stage, uh, the green was there uh, and uh, with a view to letting it cure, letting it to dry out a little bit before I went over with some reddish glazes, which I did, I did do later. And here, uh, correcting the drawing a little bit late, uh, using some mosses to strategically <laughs> change the foot of the bird because the drawing wasn't quite uh, the way I wanted to. And back to those lovely uh, leaf cutter leaves. Uh, I have seen leaf cutter ants carrying leaves across it, and it does have that appearance. But this is the way that the, the those leaves grow on the underside. Why on the underside? Leaves need uh, sunlight uh, to interact with the chlorophyll, the green colouring, to make food. So why would they grow on the on the darker underside? Surely they grow on top, like the bromeliad. So there must be a reason. Now here, I'm putting in small dots of yellow. This is 
cadmium yellow light so I'm sticking with my uh, color palette and there is a small amount of titanium in the mix but these little dollops are going to be tapped out with uh, this brush here which is called a smooshing brush I've mentioned it before and what you do is you smoosh in a kind of stippling manner just stipple out the colors and make soft transitions and blends because there's a kind of mustardy green in the background there's three blobs to the left above and to the right of the um, the Tukin, the Akikari and I wanted to bring that out a little bit more get a little bit closer to that effect so get the effect without having any anxiety whatsoever about getting you know an exact copy of that effect uh, in hindsight if I was to do it again I could do all the background uh, first do all the uh, the soft focus work but um, you know painting is uh, a dialogue and so as you work some pieces you just they just suggest uh, other work that needs to be done and so I'm using the smooshing brush to um, put a little bit of warmth into the into the background and then transition it out gently blend it in uh, to make a, uh, you know a soft focus bokeh b-o-k-e-h so I did actually have a little bit of anxiety when I put those dots on what would the result be but actually in reality um, it was very very easy to do and again with the stand oil and water mix um, with a bias towards the stand oil um, the paint was very viscous very gloopy very easy um, to work with and something that I would uh, very much want to do again so there's some lighter areas going on there but as well as dabbing in I can clean the brush off screen on this tile that I'm resting on yep and um, you know um, make greater transitions so we'll go back to the class now and so that's what happened um, a lot more building up a lot more lifting out so if you clean the brush wipe it off you can actually remove uh, paint as well and that helps you um, create the kind of transitioning areas as you can see some um, extra reds uh, which turned out slightly more biased towards orange kind of vermilion orange uh, kind of color uh, puts a little bit of warmth in there and helps offset uh, as a complementary color all the greenery that is round about so how did I do the background uh, the background was my mid green which is a bit like this one here uh, slightly darker than that a mid green then a dark and then that yellow used in to blend so I went mid dark light uh, um, as a strategy and so I would probably use that strategy again anyway the painting is um, is almost finished apart from the sides so I'll finish off the sides for any client who wants to buy this work um, and again the blue highlights were needed in fact um, it turned out that uh, indigo with French ultramarine blue uh, made a very very nice kind of glossy blue effect that you could sometimes see on you know rooks and crows jackdaws and and the like we've got a lovely bluing sheen in it which is more exaggerated than if you look over at the reference photo it's slightly more dull but artistic license I wanted that blue to come out and to give it that kind of a kind of glossy sheen and make it pop off the surface creating a foreground and a background and the illusion of um, uh, aerial perspective 
to increase the idea of uh, depth on the surface. So thank you again for taking time to uh, watch this. I hope you found something that was of interest to you. And I hope that it inspires creativity uh, for you to engage in uh, creative pursuits, wherever you may be. Thanks for watching this one. Hope to see you in the next one.